Uh, I'm very pleased to have James here for this wonderful result in Table Minus. Uh, so he will talk about something, yeah, the Taiwan business and LD China for Table Minus. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, thank you for the um, invite here and for hosting me and the invite for this talk. So, I'm talking about pivot minus, which I know some of you here know very well. Um, but perhaps this is still uh, a kind of new thing for some people. So I want to give a brief introduction to pivot minus first. So I think pivot minus are really nice, and there's a lot of beautiful theory going on with them. But I don't want to start showing you things about pivot minus by showing you what a pivot minor is, because when you first see it, it's very weird and unnatural looking, but I promise you the beautiful stuff once you get past this. So I'm going to show you just beautiful stuff first, and then we'll define the other ones. So we can start off by looking at some of the natural classes of graphs that are closed under pivot miners. So the most fundamental is circle graphs. So the circle graphs are intersecting graphs of chords in the circle. So here are chords, chords one to vertices of the same colour, and two vertices are adjacent if their corresponding chords intersect. And these are closed under pivot minus. And uh, one very nice theorem is that a graph planar, if and only if its fundamental graph is a bipartite circle graph. <coughs> so this gives you a back and forth between bipartite circle graphs and planar graphs. And one very nice result on circle graphs is that there's actually a version of Kortowski's theorem for circle graphs and pivot minus. So a graph, a circle graph, if and only if you don't contain <coughs> any of these 15 graphs as a pivot minor. And one really amazing thing about this theorem is that it's actually a generalization of Kuratowski's theorem for planar graphs. So using this, you can prove Kuratowski's theorem. I think it's very surprising. And the proof does not use Kuratowski's theorem? No. This is not the easiest proof of Kuratowski's theorem. But <laughs> <laughs> So another important class of graphs um, close on a vert under pivot minus is the graph of bounded rank width. So I won't go into what rank width is, but it can kind of be thought of as a um, dense analog of tree width. So of course, for tree width, we have this well-known theorem, the grid theorem, that if you forbid a planar graph as a minor, then you have bounded tree width. And there's a conjectured analog of this for pivot minus. So we already saw this back and forth between planar graphs and bipartite circle graphs. So here we have a similar thing. Where now what we're forbidding is a bipartite circle graph and as a pivot minor. And the conjecture, the conjectured pivot minor grid for them is that these graphs will have bounded rank width. So then this is still a conjecture, but we do have a theorem for vertex minus. So I won't go into what vertex minus are, but they're related to pivot minus. Just <coughs> when you forbid something as a vertex minor, you're forbidding more than if you forbid it as a pivot minor. So these are slightly less general class of graphs. And we have a grid theorem for vertex minus, which is if you forbid a circle graph as a vertex minor, then you have bounded rank width. So you've got these, um, there's this back and forth between you know, planar graphs and circle graphs, and there's these analogies between graph minor theory and pivot minor theory. OK, another natural class is bipartite graphs. So these are also pivot minor closed, and actually these are exactly the graphs that are contain them trying to as a pivot minor. And actually, one nice thing about these is that, very roughly speaking, 
um, pivot minus on bipartite graph capture minus on graph. So, um, Yeah, graph the minor of another graph if and only if um, the fundamental graph is a pivot point of the other fundamental graph. <laughs> so, another back and forth between theory of pivot minus and graph minus. And one last class, class of graphs I want to show you is actually rather surprisingly, if you take a class of line graphs and close this under pivot minus, you get more than just line graphs, so it's not pivot minor closed. But once you close it under line graphs, you don't get the class of all graphs. So this forms a, another pivot minor closed class of graphs. And actually, there's also a nice characterization of these in terms of graphic delta metroids. So your uh, pivot minor of a line graph, if and only if your fundamental graph of a graphic delta metroid. Okay, so I've discussed the main class of graph both from the pivot minus, so I said to finally define pivot minus now. Okay, so this is very different to graph minus. There's no kind of edge contraction. We're going to be complementing certain sets of edges in the graph. So for pivoting in edge UV, what we're going to look at is um, their common neighbourhoods and their individual neighbourhoods. So we want to look at these three sets. We want to look at the neighbours that U has that are not neighbours of V. So it's individual neighbourhood, the individual neighbourhood of V, these vertices, and their common neighbourhood here. And now essentially the act of pivoting, our edge UV, is we're going to complement the edges between these three sets. So, say a neighbourhood looked like this, and we had these two edges to begin with. Then now when we pivot on UV, we're going to complement between each of these. So, we got rid of this edge here, we swapped that edge for that edge, and we got these two edges back. So, going back, pivoting UV, we go from here to here. So, quite a weird operation when you first see this, but there's a lot of this beautiful theory going on. And then, yeah, so, so a graph that pivot mine of another graph if you can obtain it from a sequence of pivots and vertex deletions. Okay, so it's a strange operation when you first see it, but we can look at something easy we can do first, like some kind of easy pivot minus we can take. So one nice thing will be that actually odd subdivisions of graphs are universal for pivot minus. So an odd subdivision of a graph is when you replace each edge with paths of odd length. And the reason this ends up being universal is because you can shorten these paths by two at a time. So say we had something like this in our graph, where these two vertices um, have no additional neighbours other than these on the path. Then we can pivot on this edge here. And all that's going to do is give us this extra edge here. And then we can delete these two. And so we've sorted this path by two. So that's one easy thing we can do. And uh, because of this, we can show that if we have an odd subdivision of a graph, then we can find it as a pivot minor. So, for instance, any proper odd subdivision of Kn is going to contain every n vertex of a graph as a pivot minor. So say we're looking to find this full vertex graph as a pivot minor, and we have this odd subdivision of Kn. Then the way we'll go about finding this as a pivot minor is, well, we don't have these two edges, so we can delete these corresponding paths, remove them, 
and then his remaining path he wants to start shortening. So we can start off looking at this edge, pivot here, and delete, shortening it. And we just continue this, pivot here, shorten, delete. And now this is given one of our edges. And we do this for the other path. The two new structural results for pivot miners I want to talk about today is that if you have a proper pivot miner closed class of graphs, so this is the same as, as you forbid something as a pivot miner, then you have the Erdos Heinel property, or actually the strong Erdos Heinel property, and you're also chi bounded. So I'll get into what each of these two things actually mean, and I'll start off with uh, discussing the Erdos Heinel property. OK, so just this very famous conjecture of Erdos and Heinel, that if you forbid some graph as an induced subgraph, then with your class of graphs, um, you can always find a polynomially sized either clique, this is this omega of g, or independent set, this alpha of g. So in other words, there's some positive c, so that you can always find number of vertices to the power of c, size, independent set of clique. So they proved this bound of um, not polynomial, but you can at least get something of a form um, 2 to the root log g. And this was only very recently improved, adding on an extra log log factor. <laughs> so to give an example for pivot minus, um, we have a Erdos Heinel result for circle graphs. So for circle graphs, you can actually find almost um, square root size, leak or independent set. So you can find it of size at least about a uh, square root number of vertices over log number of vertices. And this is actually tied up to um, this constant factor at the front here. OK, so it's convenient to say, essentially, when this conjecture holds. So we say a class of graphs has the uh, final property if we can find um, this positive C. Or in other words, if there are polynomially sized cliques or independent sets. So a property that strengthens the uh, final property is the strong uh, final property. So um, proving strong Erdos Heinel property is one um, tactic for obtaining Erdos Heinel property because strong Erdos Heinel property implies Erdos Heinel. So what the strong Erdos Heinel property says is that you can find linearly sized um, complete or anti-complete sets of vertices. So it says that you can find, it says that there's some positive epsilon so that any graph in your class you can find a pair of vertex, vertex sets A and B, each of size at least epsilon times number of vertices, so that they're either complete or anti-complete. That means you either have every single possible edge between the two sets or none of them. So this is stronger than Erdos Heinel, but there's a lot more. We know that not all classes satisfy stronger Erdos Heinel, so even just triangle free graphs don't satisfy Erdos Heinel. So it is a strictly stronger property. And to give one nice example of a class of graphs that has a stronger designer property, if you forbid a forest as an induced subgraph and the complement of your forest as an induced subgraph as well, then this class has a stronger designer property. OK. So going to pivot minus, there's this conjecture that uh, if you forbid a pivot minor, then you have a stronger designer property. So this is kind of a um, pivot minor analog of a uh, designer conjecture. We're just replacing um, forbidding an induced subgraph with forbidding a pivot minor. So what was known before is that this is true for 
vertex minus instead of pivot minus. So this vertex minor analog of uh, a designer can take is true. And actually, we even have the strong designer property. And it was known in the case of cycles. So if you forbid a cycle as a pivot minor, then you have a strong designer property. And then one of our results that is that if you forbid any arbitrary graph as a pivot minor, then you have a stronger designer property. OK, so we saw earlier that one thing you can do with pivot minus is if you have an odd subdivision of a graph, then you can find this graph as a pivot minor as well. So closely related to this is if you're looking at subdivisions of a graph, so now you're just replacing edges by paths of any length program, odd length. So you're forbidding more here. And here's there is a nice result on uh, a designer property. So if you forbid the induced subdivisions of some graph and the complements of these subdivisions, then you have the strong designer property. So this is something that's um, encouraging for pivot minus. Um, this isn't quite as strong as odd subdivision, but it's close. You've got something similar. And then there's this complement thing. Uh, actually, what we prove for doing pivot minus is something very close to this. So I can tell you exactly the induced subgraphs we need to forbid rather than this pivot minus. <coughs> so we prove a version of this where, which is a strengthening, where we replace subdivision by what we call a fuzzy odd subdivision. So what this is, is now when we're replacing an edge with something, we're replacing it with an odd length path, but where we possibly have an extra edge along this path. So we could possibly have a triangle on this path, but only one. Only so does the extra edge have to be a triangle? Yeah, it has to be a triangle. And it has to be like the interior of the path. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of very close to getting an odd subdivision. Just you can have one edge messing you up. But for pivot minus, this doesn't mess you up too much. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so. And I can tell you why. It's because we can do our same trick still when we have this triangle of still shortening our paths by two. So say we had a triangle here like this. We can still pivot along this edge. And now this is just a common neighbor for two vertices. And this one's um, mm. individual neighbor of this one. So we're doing exactly the same thing when we pivot here. Oh, we add this edge in. And then we can delete this. So exactly the same thing works. So this is for when we find a actually induced fuzzy odd subdivision. There's also this um, complement, which is uh, stranger looking. So to get from complement to actually finding a pivot minus you want, this is harder and you have to do it very non-obvious sequence of pivots and things magically work out. But to try and give you some intuition of why some kind of sequence of pivots like this should work is this complement of the graph. Um, all we're doing when we're doing pivots is doing certain edge complementations in our graph. If we're complementing the whole graph, this is in some sense a simple kind of perturbation of our graph. So you would expect that in some sense, you shouldn't be getting too far away from the class you were before when you close under pivots. So it's not obvious how you get back here, but that's a rough intuition on how you can expect that if we find a complement instead, things shouldn't be too bad. OK. So we have this theorem for fuzzy odd subdivision. And something that at first looks like we're kind of taking a shortcut here is 
you know, it just generalizes the theorem for subdivisions. But these fuzzy odd subdivisions are a weird thing. Like, it would be very nice if you could get rid of this, and this was just a theorem on forbidding odd subdivisions and their complements. But actually, something that really surprised me is that actually that's impossible, then it's false. So if you're only forbidding odd subdivisions of graphs and the complement of these things, then you don't have a strong order final property anymore. Um, so the construction showing this is actually within the class of perfect graphs. So this weird fuzzy odd subdivision is really a necessary condition for this to work. Okay. So I'll move on to Kai Vanders now. Stop me if you have any questions. So when you um, have the complement of the <laughs> fuzzy odd subdivision, then maybe by pure minor you don't get h, but maybe you want to get yeah. something smaller than h, which is still is kind of universal. Yeah, so you don't get h anymore. Uh -huh. um, but you can get something much smaller. So uh -huh. this is natural just to consider h to be like complete graphs so or yeah, trying to get a um, a two subdivision where you replace every other of a complete graph with a path of length three, because that's universal for pivot minus. So that's kind of what you want to aim for. But it might be that our h needs to be a much bigger version of this. So you, you build a bigger graph so that later you can yeah the pivot to recover. Hmm. I see. And yeah, there's a lot of Ramsey and stuff, so uh -huh. it ends up being a lot bigger. Okay, so kai boundedness. So this is on now colorings of our graph. So <coughs> um, our colorings just assignment of colors so that adjacent vertices receive different colors and chromatic numbers for minimum number of colors you need to do this. So the clique number gives a lower bound to a chromatic number of a graph. And this is just because in a clique, you're just a set of pairwise adjacent vertices, so every vertex needs its own color. This gives you a lower bound. So for instance, in this graph, because we have this triangle, we know we need at least three colors, and actually three colors is enough for coloring this graph. So you can ask about when can you get an upper bound in terms of the clique number. So a class of graphs is chi bounded if there's a function giving you an upper bound of a chromatic number in terms of the clique number of the graph in your graph. And this makes sense to consider for this class of graphs because the class of all graphs is not chi bounded. So very classical result of ta is that there's triangle three graphs, so graphs of clique number two <coughs> with arbitrary large chromatic number. OK, so I want to go through a few results for chi boundedness. And I'm going to focus on results to do with forbidding induced subdivisions. Because we saw before, if we can do something for induced subdivisions, this doesn't translate to pivot minus at all. But it gives some hope that you could maybe try and adjust things and get things to work. So one nice result is that if you forbid the induced subdivisions of a tree, then you're chi bounded. So it's a kind of like a topological guy for some of them. Another nice thing is that this is true for cycles. Or in other words, if you don't have a long hole, you're chi bounded. And another result generalizing both of these is that this is true if you forbid induced subdivisions of what's called a banana tree. So don't need to worry about too much about exactly what these are, but they generalize trees and cycles, and you can also have these theta-like things inside your banana tree. Now, you might hope that this is true in general, and that if you forbid any graph, and it's induced subdivision, you be chi bounded. And this was conjectured, but actually it turns out to be false. And it's false for small graphs like one subdivisions of K5. 
So the construction for this is a, actually a geometric construction of intersects and graph of segments in the plane. Mm. And this is where this K5 appears here, just because K5 is not planar. OK, so this is false. You can't get something so good in general. But then for pivot minus, we have this conjecture that um, any proper class is chi-bounded. So if you forbid something as a pivot minor, then it should be chi-bounded. <coughs> so one very classical result, both in the study of like chi-boundedness and study of geometric intersection graphs, is that circle graphs are chi-bounded. So you know this is one of our most fundamental classes of pivot minor closed classes. Another is that graphs of bounded rank widths are also chi bounded. And we also have a theorem for vertex minus rather than pivot minus. So if we're forbidding vertex minus instead, then we're also chi bounded. And one more result that was known for this conjecture is that it's true for cycles. So if you forbid a cycle as a pivot minor, then you're chi bounded. And then the other main result I want to talk about is that this conjecture is true. So proper pivot minor closed class here graphs are high bounded. So for Erda final property, I could kind of take out this pivot minor part of the theorem and just tell you what these two subgraphs I'm finding are. And in theory, you could do that for this as well, but you don't want to see that. <laughs> 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 the induced subgraphs are much more complicated, and there's nothing insightful there. It's really pivot minus. Do you <laughs> have that form in the paper, or do you just keep this form? Is it? Oh, definitely this form. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I would not want to attempt writing that down. <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about this proof, but it's definitely more complicated than the Erdos Heiner one. So most of what I'm going to be talking about is it's really more general chi boundedness methods. So there's not going to be anything specialized to pivot minus, but this is exactly the kind of stuff that we use in the pivot minor proof. OK, so I'm going to start off by uh, giving a brief overview of what's really the most classical kind of argument you see in uh, kite manners proofs. And this is a leveling argument. <coughs> so the idea is that you start with one vertex in your graph, and now you start looking out from here. So you begin with looking at this neighborhood, and then you can look at the second neighborhood, so the vertices are distance two. And you can keep going until for some t, you find that the vertices at distance t have at least half chromatic number still. And the reason you can do this is because if each Luffel had less than half chromatic number, then you'd be able to save colors, because there's no edges between non-consecutive Luffels. So you could just assign one lot of half colors for the even Luffels, these red colors, and another half colors for the odd Luffels or blue ones. So we can always find this level with at least half chromatic number. And one nice property you have in these levelings is that whenever you have a vertex in the level, it always needs to have a parent vertex in the previous level. OK. And this is something you can repeat as well. So say we take one leveling, keep going until we get somewhere with a big chromatic number. Now we can take a vertex in here and do another leveling inside this. And again, get somewhere with big chromatic number. So each time we do this leveling, we're halving the chromatic number. But if we start off huge, we can do this as many times as we want. And now, when you do this, you end up getting a nice structure. So you've got this blue set with large chromatic number. And each vertex in this blue set 
has a parent vertex in each of these purple sets covering it. And each vertex in these purple sets also has a parent in its parent red set. These red sets we don't know too much about, but we do know that they're connected. And then you can also get some extra kind of unwanted edges between these purple sets and in these purple sets and going to further right red sets. Um, so structures like this you can get through this repeated luffling and you can often start extracting and use subgraphs and get kind of this proof this way. Okay, so I want to talk about a way of really getting more out of this method. And this is using the notion of row control. So if you think about what chi boundness is really saying, if your class is chi bounded, then what that means is that if you have huge chromatic number, then the reason for this is really an extreme extremely local property of the graph. If you have huge chromatic number, then somewhere you can find this big clique. So this is a very, very local reason you have huge chromatic number. So rather than going straight for this very, very local property, you could start off with something easier and then try and build down from there. So, and this is what the notion of row control aims to capture. So we say a class is row controlled. Sorry. So what we want to do is look at the chromatic number of balls of radius rho. So we're looking at a vertex and it's uh, the vertices are distance the most rho. So this is what this chi rho is. And we say a class is rho controlled if there exists a function bounding the chromatic number of your graph in terms of the maximum chromatic number of a rho ball. So what being rho control means is that you don't necessarily have this super local property of having a big leak, but if you have huge chromatic number, then this has got to be concentrated locally somewhere. Huge chromatic number will imply that you've got this row ball, much smaller, but still has large chromatic number. Okay, and this gives a good strategy, because this would be easier to prove that you're row controlled for some large row than for proving high boundness. So the first step of the strategy is to prove that you're row controlled for some possibly large row. And then from here you start um, going down and making this more and more local. So the second step is to reduce your row until eventually you get down to two control. And then two control is very nice and then you can try and use this to prove chi boundness. So I want to talk a bit about why this being too controlled is so helpful. And essentially it's because we can do this repeated luffling strategy, but now instead of our lufflings, we can take these two balls of large chromatic number. So if we're too controlled, that means that somewhere in the graph, we have a two ball with large chromatic number, assuming we start with a huge chromatic number. So we can do this once, and then in the second neighborhood, we must go have a huge chromatic number. So we can do this again, and find another two ball inside here with big chromatic number still. And this is basically looking at like a repeated lessening again. But now the structure we get out of this is much nicer. So before we had these big red sets where we didn't really know much other than that they're connected. Now they're just single vertices, which is about the best you could hope for and what you want to know about them. And this is then much easier to start extracting um, useful and use subgraphs or pivot minus L. Okay. I think I missed something. Why do you know that the red vertices are a stable set? Uh, because... So, the red vertices are going to be the centers ah, okay, of these okay. two balls. Yeah, and thanks. Yeah. yeah, that's easy. And the reason we can go to these second neighborhoods is because if we're proving chi bounders, we're arguing inductively on peak numbers, so mm -hmm. 
we can always assume this first neighborhood is small commuting number. Okay. So really um, what often ends up being the hard step is to prove that you're road controlled. So I want to talk a little bit about some things and why. Um, this is easier to do than proving chi bounders straight away. So one thing you often do in chi bounders proof is when you're arguing inductively on the clique number, the neighborhood of a vertex is always going to have smaller clique number. So the neighborhood of a vertex is always going to have banded chromatic number if you're arguing inductively. If you're trying to go free, the neighborhood is just a stable set. So often what you're doing in chi bounders proof is this. You're deleting these one balls. This doesn't reduce chromatic number too much. And you keep going like that. But now of row control, we're assuming that our row balls have a bad chromatic number. So instead of only being to remove these small one balls, we can remove much bigger row balls. So that's one very basic advantage. Uh, a kind of more advanced thing is that you can do things like uh, this technical looking lemma. But essentially, what this lemma says is that if we're row controlled for some big row, then actually inside our graph we can find distant subgraphs of a large chromatic number. So say we had our leveling structure like this, this is big chromatic number, then what this is saying is that inside here we can find two sets that are far away from each other and that both have large chromatic numbers still. So you can kind of split things. And now, one nice thing about this is that now we can start looking at each of these individually. So for instance, this is a big chromatic number. We could take another lush thing, say. And same here. And these act independently of each other because they're far away from each other. So this is another way of being able to extract more structure out of your graph and um, be able to find more um, induce subgraph and eventually pivot minus. And I should say, really, this lemma is actually, again, based off a lemma for subdivisions. So uh, Scott and Seymour proved the analog of this where instead of forbidding a pivot minor, you're forbidding induced subdivisions. OK. So. I want to end by uh, talking about a conjecture that would generalize these results. So our two main results is that if you forbid a pivot minor, then you have a strong odor signer property, and you're high bounded. And there's actually a very strong conjecture that if you forbid a pivot minor, then you're polynomially high bounded. So this means that this bound in terms of the clique number for the chromatic number you get can be taken to be some polynomial. So this is something you um, absolutely don't get if you're doing these kind of luffling arguments, because each time you take a luffling, you're half in chromatic number, and usually you have to do this more and more as the clique number gets bigger. So this is much more challenging than chi bounders. And it's known that polynomial chi bounders implies the Erda final property. It doesn't imply the strong order signer property, but it does imply the order signer property. And also, polynomial chi boundness is a strictly stronger property than chi boundness. So we know that there are classic graphs that are chi bounded but not polynomially chi bounded. Okay, so some results that are known towards this conjecture circle graphs, we know are polynomially chi bounded. And another fundamental class, graphs of bounded rank width, are also polynomially chi bounded. So there's good evidence that this conjecture should be true, but it's extreme, it would be extremely challenging and probably require structure theorem, which is very far out of reach for pivot pointers, I think, at the moment. One conjecture I do want to mention again is this conjectured um, grid theorem for pivot minus, that if you forbid the uh, bipartite circle graph is a pivot minor, then you're bounded rank width. So this would prove a case of the polynomial chi bounds conjecture because graphs are bounded rank width 
um, a polynomial Klein bounded. So um, this will give one nice case for this conjecture for when you're forbidding a part of circle class. I'll stop there. Right, thank you very much. Uh, you're killing too many problems for me. <laughs> <laughs> any, any questions? So for the um, strong order channel result, for the fuzzy odd subdivisions, this proof is like pretty similar to the subdivisions proof? or just Yeah, it's definitely yeah. adapting that. Um, there's bits where it's a bit harder, but it is very much adapting that subdivision proof. I remember the last time you gave an online talk about the, uh, the sky boundaries for vertex miners. Uh, there, was a, there was a remark that uh, your approach doesn't work for people miners for certain steps, mm -hmm. right? What was that, and uh, how did you overcome that difficulty? Um, I guess I worked harder. Some <laughs> 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 of the steps are same, right? This yeah. Picture same, so, uh, yeah. So the step of going from two control to chi bounded is very similar. Uh huh. And also the step of going from row control down to two control. Uh -huh. It's a bit harder, but it's not too much harder. The bit that's a lot more challenging is doing row control. Yeah. And here. Um, so you couldn't reuse any of the landmarks in the vertex miner paper for this thing? You have to go through every step? So can reuse the work for going from 2 to 12 to chi bound on this. Uh -huh. And there's a round zero result on finding certain induced tree-like things you can reuse. Uh -huh. But otherwise you have to redo a lot. Ooh, and so one key difference is this being able to find distance subgraphs of large chromatic number. Mm -hmm. This is something you don't need to do for vertex minus, but uh -huh. something you very much do in the pivot minor proof. Mm. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the tricky thing with pivot minus is that there's kind of more traps you can fall into because you're looking for something like an odd subdivision, but there's traps like if you're bipartite, you're trapped in the class of bipartite graphs. If you fall into a line graph, which can be nice for vertex minus still, you're trapped in this line graph class. So there's cases where you need to avoid falling into any one of these kind of things. Does the old subdivision of trees has is count bounded or is there any reason? Mm -hmm. Or the odd subdivisions of trees. Or the odd subdivisions. I think there's no result for odd subdivisions. I really think it should be true, but potentially it could be implied by Scastia. I don't know. It's by Like some rims. Yeah, I, I don't think it's known, but I definitely believe it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there a class of graphs which is not row control for any integer row? Yeah, so there's graphs with large skirt and chromatic number. Ah, okay. so classes that contain those. <laughs> um, can you factor a slice to a strong uh, early hydrogen property? Um, 
the polynomial yeah, kind of another one. There is a conjecture about the um, polynomial So this one can show the conjecture is true, right? Or not? Uh, so polynomial kind of implies a design off, but not the yeah. other way around. Yeah, but uh, you have already shown um, is a strong early hydrogen property, right? Yeah. Um, so stronger design of stronger than the but not necessarily related to polynomial kind of boundary. I think there must be classes with a stronger design or property. Then. Yeah, okay. So if you're forbidding subdivisions and complements of subdivisions, that's stronger design or property. But that class isn't quite bounded. Um, just because that other Berlin graph you use for um, saying that forbidding subdivisions of this. K5 mm -hmm. isn't quite bounding, but also works still. So there's, quite, there's classes with the stronger design of property that are not quite bounded. Let's thank the speaker.